We'll get going and let people filter in. Welcome to everybody here and to people online. Um, it's a pleasure to host Joe Huang in this uh, Jones seminar. Um, he's somebody I've known for a number of years uh, through collaborations at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And, um, uh, you know, there's certain people you meet in your life who you say, I really got to keep my eye on that person because they're doing really, really cool stuff. And Joe is definitely in that category for me. Um, he, let me tell you his history. Uh, he did his PhD at uh, Arizona State University in chemical engineering in 2012. He then did um, a postdoc stint at the Harvard Med School, Massachusetts General Hospital at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine, uh, ending in 2018. From there, he went on to the University of Maryland, where he's an assistant professor now in bioengineering. And um, he has uh, just been doing great work. And you can tell by his funding record, he was funded by a K99 R00, and then an R01, and now an R21. Uh, so for somebody uh, his this age of his career, he's really just knocking it out of the park. Um, he's published about 50 papers, uh, many of them uh, in really high-ranked journals, ACS Nano, Cancer Research, Langmuir, Nanoscale, Journal of Controlled Release, um, really just great stuff. And his research, you know, I would say is unusual and creative. And in, in the academic world, that's either really bad or really good, you know. In this case, I think it's in the good, good category. Uh, and it, it's both fundamental and applied at the same time. And that's really kind of the magic in biomedical engineering that's very important, um, so it's a pleasure to have you here, and I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you, Brian, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I want to start off by saying, like, like throughout my career, I have, like, wonderful mentors, like Taya Bob. Brian is definitely one of them that I always look up. And then. so a lot of my success is because of these great mentors. And today I'm going to talk about uh, talk to you about like what is happening in my lab. Like uh, today's work, we'll be focusing on one of my uh, PhD students' uh, thesis. And as you can see on the right here, this is our department. I moved into this building in 2018, where I started as an assistant professor in uh, College Park, University of Maryland. So uh, let's uh, go to the next slide. So where are we really located at? Like if you think about College Park, uh, Maryland, we are really uh, next to uh, the USA Capitol, Washington, D.C. We're just uh, uh, south from the Baltimore, like where the med school lies. And as you can see here, we're really surrounded by all these federal agencies like FDA, NIH, uh, NSF. So a lot of students like uh, go there, do work. We have a lot of collaboration, so it's really a unique like place, and I really enjoy like being able to reach out and collaborate with people in these uh, areas. And that is how I kind of build my lab. Like collaboration is what drives what we are doing here. So I want to uh, quickly tell you like the general uh, research directions that my lab is doing. Today I'm going to focus on one aspect only, but happy to discuss uh, more of these later on. So like many of the labs here, like I'm very interested in how to use light to improve uh, human health. And we are interested in improving and translating photodynamic therapy into the clinic for uh, cancer. And today, specifically, I'm going to tell you a story how we discovered and found out that actually photochemistry could be used to modulate some of the proteins at the cancer cell surface. And these proteins are really important because they lead to the acquisition of multi-drug resistance, which is a huge problem in cancer treatment. And then we have other projects focusing on developing nanoformulations to co-deliver uh, photosynthesizers that we use for our phototherapy, but also chemotherapy or small molecule inhibitors. And how we design this is really driven by our mechanistic understanding of the cancer cell biology. So we take that information, put on our engineering hats, and then design our formulation. And being so close with the FDA, we have recently started a project that just started 
working with FDA to help streamline some of the photo safety uh, guidelines that are out there. So the, the last update on the guidelines about 15 years ago. So there's all these like new and emerging agents that we need to pay more attention because we are using them to image uh, things that are deep inside the body. So it's just, we have to think beyond skin toxicity from now on. So <clears throat> I focus, uh, I separate this uh, talk into four parts. The first part, I'll be talking about how we modulate the photosensitizer, how we do certain uh, biomolecular engineering to help escape some of these transporters. Then the next chapter will be focusing on when we turn on the light, how we can use light to modulate the transporter function. And then going into some of the nanoformulation and then also asking us and ourselves to think beyond just the transporter because drug delivery is not the one-way street. We have to think about many different scenarios. And I'll use brain as an example to tell you the story. And uh, so most of the uh, work that uh, I'm present here today is uh, carried out by this amazing student, Barry Liang. The last part of the work uh, will be uh, that I'm going to talk about is mostly carried out by Colin Inglet. And we have two really amazing collaborators at the NIH, Michael Goffman and Suresh Ambika. They are kind of hardcore cancer cell biology folks focusing on understanding these transporters that I'm going to talk about. So let's take a step back a little bit, think about cancer. We all know cancer resistant to therapy is multidimensional. It could be intrinsic or acquired. So frequently, uh, resistance is intrinsic to cancer cells. But, but as we start developing more sophisticated or more effective therapies, uh, the acquired resistance becomes like uh, more problematic. And one of the main reasons for the acquisition of resistance to many chemo drugs is the overexpression of certain proteins on cancer cell surface. And these proteins are known to efflux a lot of drugs, like, like hundreds of drugs from inside the cell to outside the cell. So it's a detoxification that is built in our body, but cancer cells not surprisingly, learn how to adapt this mechanism and then, uh, uh, and then use them to escape treatment. So let's talk a little bit more about this transporter. These transporters are known as ATP binding cassette transporters, also known as ABC transporters. And in our body, like uh, we have 48 of these transporters and they collectively transport a lot of like drugs, toxin, uh, uh, and it's a really important detoxification mechanism. And here I uh, highlight three uh, different transporters, ABCG2, ABCG P-glycoprotein, also known as PGT, or ABCG1, or MRP1. And as you can see here, these are transmembrane proteins that have an extracellular domain. A transmembrane domain when I heard a drug, drug or substrate or dye cysts that will be out. And we have this intracellular domain that is where ATP and ATPase activity will occur. So these transporters can be found in like a lot of places in our body, like placenta, globin barrier, because as I mentioned before, it's a very important way our body detoxify uh, detoxify uh, uh, like insults. So here on the right, I quickly summarize some of the drugs that are commonly seen and uh, are commonly used for cancer chemotherapy. So you can see there are drugs that can be pumped out by two transporters. There's drugs that can be even pumped out by three different transporters. So thinking about this, knocking out one of the transporters won't be enough as well. And so far over the past 30 years, there's like tons of studies that have been designed in small molecule inhibitors, which are shown and listed on the uh, left and right here. These inhibitors have been developed to try to overcome some of these uh, multi-drug resistance. And as you can see here, there are over 22 phase three clinical trials. And unfortunately, none of them, like, 
And this is because, as I mentioned before, a lot of these transporters are present in our normal tissue. So if you just keep on injecting these agents, I intentionally, uh, 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 these inhibitors will become too toxic and leading to a lot of drug-drug interactions. And uh, so that has been uh, the problem. So currently, the field doesn't really have a good solution to it yet. And I can go into the timeline a little bit more. Like, as you can see, in the early 70s, this is where people really start observing the drug transport. ABCD1 was termed uh, six years afterwards. We have three generations of inhibitors. The first generation is just not potent enough to inhibit these transporters. And the second generation altered the pharmacokinetics of the drug. And the third generation, they made it work. It's very potent, but it's too toxic. So these kind of failures have kind of led to like a, a, a slowdown, slowdown in developing uh, small molecule inhibitors for these ABC transporters. So basically, from based on what we have learned over the past 30 years, we know we really need a strategy that is site-specific. When I say that, it means that if we can only direct our treatment to the target site, such as tumor, then that would be ideal. We can spare all the other normal tissues. And then besides that, with the advance of our understanding of how the transporter works, like we hope we can better design our treatments for the, to target these ABC transporters. So here uh, we drew out this schematic that basically summarizes three nature papers talking about our understanding on how this transporter works. So you have a substrate here. The substrate could be a drug, a dye, or anything that like this transporter wants to eat up now. So the sub substrate will bind to the transmembrane domain, which has the binding site. And after that, you need to have two ADP that binds to their uh, nucleotide binding domain. And the binding of these two ADP leads to a conformational change of this protein. So now you see it opens out. So the, the agent could be pushed from inside the cell to outside the cell. And the ATP hydrolysis, it really kind of resets the conformation. So you have this cycle. So based on this, we know that protein conformational change is really uh, important and for the, the ATPase activity. And uh, so with that in mind, what is our solution? So in our lab, we, uh, like many of you, we uh, focus on photodynamic therapy. This is a treatment that involves light activation of a non-toxic uh, compound. It could be a photosynthesizer or a dye. And upon light activation at a particular wavelength, you can generate photochemistry. And we leverage that photochemistry to kill cells or modulate tissues. And uh, Dharmos has a really strong like, imaging program. A lot of these photosynthesizers generate like, imaging. It provides us additional information to help guide the treatment design. And this is a case that uh, a patient will receive, uh, in this case, uh, IV administration of the photosynthesizer. Like most of the chemotherapy, they'll go to different places in your body. But in this case, it's not too problematic as long as we shield the patient from the light. And with the advance of optical fibers and light delivery strategies, as long as we can confine the light to the site of interest, we can therefore confine our toxicity like, uh, to that place and also use it for imaging. So this is just an example uh, showing you that photodynamic therapy can be used for head and neck cancer. In this case, in this, case uh, this is a chronic smoker. He yeah, went through surgery, chemotherapy. None of the things work. Eventually, uh, he was given photodynamic therapy and chemotherapy. And the response in this case was really good. And this, was, this happened a while ago, and just to Keep you guys up to date, but like recently there is a targeted version of a photosynthesizer that was actually just approved in Japan for head and neck cancer. So people are developing like newer probes to try to uh, target these uh, hard to treat uh, diseases. And definitely in this next slide is something that uh, most of you are really familiar here, like using uh, 
the force, the force and signal from the photosensitizer to help surgeons better look at tumor margins and clean out like uh, the tumors uh, during a brain surgery. So as you can see here on the left, like if you have a glioblastoma, the hard part is not to remove the primary tumor. The hard part is to really tackle this uh, like infiltrates that are beyond the primary tumor. And there's always these tumors that are coming back. So definitely in the field, people are combining fluorescence-guided surgery with photodynamic therapy, trying to mock out these residual uh, disease. We focus it on, from a different angle, we're interested in more opening up some of the blood brain barrier, making sure the drug can be efficiently transported to these uh, uh, residual uh, tumor infiltrated like surgical bed. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that project toward, towards the end. So that being said, this is a slide that really summarizes uh, what, is, uh, what type of cancers or uh, precancers of conditions are being used, uh, are being treated with photodynamic therapy. As you can see, there's a, a bunch of clinic things uh, that are approved in the clinic. Uh, actively, if you look at clinical trials, like you see a lot of people working on pancreatic tumors, like brain tumor, ovarian, liver, and breast. And like uh, as we all know, Darmos like here has a really strong like program project grant focusing on pancreas and skin uh, cancer. And this, I think, I always put this up, but I think the audience here knows this well already. Like we can deliver light to areas that are deep inside the body through like, different approaches. It could be combined with surgery and intraoperative. You can do endoscopes or you can do interstitial by inserting fibers into large like tumors that are undesirable. So the, there are many ways of delivering light uh, creatively. So in our lab, we are very, uh, we're interested and we focus on like, understanding and improving this photosensitizer known as benzoporphin derivative. It's also known as vertiporphin. And as you can see, this is a tetrapyral structure. There's a lot of delocalized pyrene, and that is important for the intersystem crossing. But because of this like delocalized pyrene, these compounds are very easily, they can be stacked together leading to aggregation. That's why the clinical formulation currently is mixing some of these compounds with lipids just to improve the solubility. And this is the absorption spectrum of the compound. You see a solid band around 450, 430 nanometers. There's a, like a bigger Q band around 690 uh, nanometer, and this is where we uh, excite it. As I mentioned before, upon excitation, we generate total chemistry. Using a single oxygen sensor green probe here, we can detect uh, single oxygen uh, when light is uh, being used to activate the photosensitizer, while the rest of the controls like, did not generate any significant amount of fluorescent signal. So this is just to kind of show you again. And in this process, like no heat uh, is being generated. And if you look at this uh, compound, currently there are multiple clinical trials like, going on using this compound alone, either uh, for photodynamic therapy, or very interestingly, you know, like this glioblastoma grant, like uh, sorry, the trial, they're using this compound as a chemotherapy because it modulates the gap pass pathway. So this is kind of a very different use. They're not using it as a dye. They don't want to activate it, activate it by light. They're just using it as a chemotherapy but you need to crank up the dose like 100 times or something. So, so but this is just to show you that uh, there's a lot of interest with uh, using this compound in the clinic here. So here, uh, before I told you about a lot of chemotherapies could be pumped out by these uh, transporters, right? these ABC transporters. How about photosensitizers? As you can see summarized on the right, you can see PP9, photofilm, these are all substrate of these transporters. So imagine that if you have, if you want to achieve high accumulation of these photosensitizers in a cell, like you do want to make sure that some of these cells don't express, uh, don't overexpress some of these transporters because these transporters will eventually pump out all your dyes and so you won't have a good imaging or therapeutic outcome. 
So how about basal corpus derivative, the one compound that we're interested in? So, in fact, in 2019, we discovered that benzyl porphyrin derivative is a substrate for both ABCD1 and ABCD2, but not MRP1. MRP1 is ABCD1. So in this study, like this is facts, and on the x-axis, you look at BPD4 and signal, like no treatment, this is the baseline. So we just incubate our cells, like breast cancer cells in CF7, this is a modified cell line that overexpress ABCG2. So you have some baseline uh, accumulation of the photosensitizer. When you add in FTC, which inhibits ABCG2, you see a boost in accumulation of the drug, right, or of the photosensitizer inside the cell. This suggests that right, uh, BCG2 is a substrate for ABCG2. Similar studies with different cell lines, which the X400 on the right, you see this can see that BPD is also a substrate for ABCD1. So I'm not showing the ABC3, 1, MRP1, the other data. But this study basically tells us that if you want to work on this compound, it's important to also understand some of these uh, transporter status in your cells as well, because it might impact your intracellular concentration significantly. And remember, this is a tenfold, right? This is log scale. So. So you do see uh, a dramatic change in, change in intracellular force and signal. So this is what I'm going to start going into like, for different projects. The first one is focusing on, without turning on the light, like how can we modify our compound in a way that they somehow, it's not a substrate of these transporters anymore. So uh, in this part one of the uh, talk, I'm going to show you how we can conjugate a lipid onto benzoporphin uh, derivative and then mitigate its e, its e flux. And also, like many of you are working here on the targeted strategy, we can also conjugate our photosensitizers to an antibody that targets uh, ABCD1. So, so the concept of combining uh, macromolecules like to a photosensitizer and then uh, prevent uh, photosensitizer efflux is not really new. Like as you can see here in 2009, like there's this group that conjugated HPPH, which is a photosensitizer with the sugar group. Once they conjugate that, they found out that, okay, this drug is photosensitizer, it's not being efflux like by cells anymore, they could dramatically improve their intracellular retention of this photosensitizer for a more effective treatment outcome. So taking on the similar idea, we conjugated a lipid, uh, 16-0 lyso-PC-BPD, onto uh, lyso-PC onto BPD through Easter reification reaction, and then on the right, this is just showing uh, we can create a, a pure construct with a, a single uh, uh, mass here. And we also confirm that having the lipid there doesn't really impact the photophysical and photochemical properties of the photosensitizer. As you can see on the left, the absorption spectra pretty much overlap together. Those agents could generate like fluorescent signal and uh, they could also generate single oxygen that's called light excitation. So this, uh, using this model, like we next look into uh, whether this new compound, like 16-0 lyso PCBPD, is a substrate of the transporter anymore. So if you remember what I showed you before, BPD is a substrate for ABCD2 and ABCD1. That's why when you provide inhibitor, you see a bump in signal. And in this case, like uh, for ABCD2, you don't see a change at all. This suggests that this compound, this new compound that we created uh, cannot be pumped out by the transporter uh, anymore. And we can uh, also reduce uh, uh, the ability of ABCD1 to efflux out uh, this new compound. Although this is not completely removed, we still have some efflux, but uh, the efflux uh, rate and efficacy is not as good uh, using this newer compound. 
So this is quite exciting uh, because we now have a compound, a new compound that uh, we simply attach a lipid and while maintaining its photophysical and photochemical properties. And it turns out because of higher accumulation inside the cells, we can now like, achieve a more effective like, uh, photodynamic effect like, when we uh, turn on the light at the, uh, the same uh, dose. So on the right side, you see uh, the viability change on this MCS cell line overexpressing ABCD2 by uh, using the new conjugated formulation, uh, our treatment effectively is much better. Same thing uh, with the last, the ABCD1 overexpressing cell line. So this is a different strategy, but the same concept here. In this case, we did not use a lipid, like we used a, a pro, an antibody uh, UI called UIC2. This antibody binds to the extracellular loop of uh, ABCD1, specifically the, the loop 1 and the loop 4. And we have this antibody, so what we did is we simply carried out an EDC initial chemistry by conjugating the photosensitizer to the lysine groups of the uh, antibodies you have seen here. And now we have a compound that is labeled with our photosensitizer. And we can use this for targeting ABCD1 and using it for uh, imaging and uh, treatment application. So this is, again, just to confirm the uh, absorption spectrum and the fluorescence of the conjugated formulation is not being altered uh, significantly. And in this case, we specifically kept it at like three photosensitizers uh, per antibody. We have looked into different ratios, the more you Put, that's when you start using the binding affinity of the protein itself, and you start seeing some like punching like of the uh, photosensitizers. So there are some optimizations uh, that I'm uh, skipping here. So uh, using uh, this compound that we had created, basically uh, we did a similar fact study and showed that. Uh, only in uh, breast cancer cells that overexpress ABCD1, we see uh, a binding event. In the control cell line that does not uh, overexpress this uh, ABCD1 transporter, we don't see any uh, binding. And then uh, we showed that we can use it for imaging, like compared to uh, the, the, the the, the antibody alone itself. If you just pay attention, like some attention here, you can notice, you will notice that uh, in this case, the forces intensity from this UIC2 alone is much higher than uic 2 dtd and this is what I'm talking about earlier. If you start um, engineering your protein, like if you start damaging enough license, you will dramatically compromise their binding affinity and their uh, targeting capability. So this is what we're seeing here, but despite that, this is still a good, uh, we still see a significant difference between the, the uh, cell line that has ABCD1 versus the cell line that doesn't have ABCD1. Okay. And here we uh, like did some really simple forces like imaging study and looking into the binding of these for the immunoconjugate and cancer cells and just image them. Uh, the results are fairly consistent with our fast data, so I won't go into this uh, too much. So basically in the first part of the study, uh, hopefully I've shown you that this is not a new concept, but if you think carefully and if you engineer your uh, construct intelligently, you, that might be a way to escape some of these uh, uh, transporters. So in this case, we don't even have to add another like, toxic inhibitor. So this is one uh, potential way. So moving into the second part, now it's time to turn on the light. We want to understand when we have the photochemistry in place, like how does it impact the function of, this, uh, of these ABC transporters? So this study really started when I was working with Hassan and uh, Brian 
we have this observation. This is a miapaka to pancreatic cancer cells. So in this case, uh, the nuclei are stained in blue. The green is the ABCD2 uh, transporter. In this study, we we, we just hit our photosensitizers with photosensitizers. Uh, <laughs> Incubate the cells uh, with photosensitizers and uh, shine light on that. We specifically use a really low dose that does uh, not kill the cancer cells, and we call it photodynamic priming because we're just trying to prime the cells and so the subsequent treatment is done. Like so, in this case, we observe that it seems like there's a dramatic decrease in these ABC. Uh, G2 signal. So this is more like an observation at that time. We didn't really dig into dig deep into this. And on the right, we're showing some in vivo data. So we show that this is a tumor model. You can see now you read along now you see chemotherapy that the red uh, line and that is kind of its basic uh, its profile uh, its accumulation and uh, and we combine that chemotherapy with photobiotic finding we see a dramatic increase in drug dose. So, like in animals, like there are many things that could happen. Like we could potentially be shutting down these transporters, but we could potentially also be modulating some of the tumor uh, vessel permeability or even the stromal density. So, so, so at this. Uh, Sage, we had an observation. We think something is going on at the cellular level, but we are not sure. So that's where, when I established my lab, I started to dig deep, deep, deep into that a little bit more. This is just to remind you how these transporters function. The take home message is ATPase activity is really important, protein confirmation is really important. So we decided to like, start with those two points. So we need a clean model that really doesn't have all the vasculature like, like obstacle setup and everything is controlled. So what we did is we transfected these insect cells with, so that they overexpress these transporters. And then we have to do like a proper lysis and then centrifugation. The goal is to remove everything inside the cell, all of these organelles, the nuclei, just to keep the cell membrane and the transporter. And and most importantly, these transporters need to be functional. They still need to like work, like uh, with uh, uh, under physiological conditions. So, using these transporters, we then study the ATPase activity, and th then we also look into uh, protein aggregation. So, it's a cleaner system enough for us to understand two things: like can photochemistry modulate ATPase activity? Can photochemistry crosslink some of these uh, uh, ABC transporters? So first, we carried out a, a docking analysis, a, a silico analysis. Uh, so you can see here, like based on the analysis, it's showing that the benzoporphin derivative, like sits like in this like transmembrane domain like nicely in both ABCD1 and ABCD2. This kind of confirms what we have shown earlier inside the cell that these two agents uh, DPD is a subject for ABCD1 and ABCD2. And what is interesting is here, like if you look down, we can start seeing increased concentration of benzoporphin derivative from zero to 20 micromolar. Um, the uh, y-axis is the ABCD axis. Right, if we start increasing the amount of photosensitizers without turning on the light, right, we are reducing some of the ATPase activity. This is not too surprising because like people show that like, a lot of how these inhibitors work is they kind of sit tightly in the final side. So they can dramatically reduce the ATPase activity. What is exciting here is when we turn on the light, and here we're just using 0.05 in this case, so I mean, dramatically. Uh, inhibit and remove the ATPase activity of these transporters. So this is kind of one of the first evidence showing that, okay, at the uh, protein level, we can use photochemistry to shut down some of these ATPase activity. So this is quite uh, exciting. And we also look into how the protein aggregates here. So these are gels, like from the left to right, you can see the BPD concentration increases. There's light present in most cases beside the first leg. 
what you want to focus on is CV1. This is where you should see the protein and focus on the, the top, the aggregation length. So as we start increasing the photosynthetic concentration, you see more aggregation suggesting like we are cross-linking some protein. Like currently, we're still trying to figure out what chemical bonds are being formed, like whether it's a disulfide bond or other potential like bonds. So we're doing more study there, but this is kind of one step showing that uh, at lower high dose, you can modulate the ATPs activity. If you want to cross-link proteins, that so you can uh, go to higher photosynthesis concentration and a slightly higher uh, light, uh, light dose. Okay. So, so that uh, is kind of the end of the second part, basically hopefully convincing you that photochemistry could be used to inhibit some of these, uh, the function and the protein integrity of these uh, so now it seems like we have a good tool to inhibit these uh, transporters, but would it be nice if we can co-deliver the chemotherapy that we are interested in so that everything could be locked in at the same time? And as we all know, like, um, like it is very clear already that combination treatments is most likely to achieve the, the most outcome and people are definitely targeting these ABC drug transporters and co-delivering drugs to uh, achieve a synergistic effect. And on the other side, you also want to make sure some of your uh, the treatments that you're combining have not overlapping side effects so that uh, uh, you don't uh, get into uh, uh, issues with systemic health. So this is kind of a workflow that we're currently working with uh, ovarian cancer surgeons. Like the plan is the surgeon will go in and do a surgical debulking of ovarian cancer. What they do currently is they go through the high path, like basically it's So we're thinking in between this, like, can we prime the cancer cells, like the individual cancer cells, and maybe shut down some of these transporters, and then make the subsequent people that they will be more effective. So with that in mind, like, my student went and designed a construct that can deliver, like, multiple things together. So this is a, a, a little bit complicated, but I can go through this carefully. So you have a, a cocktail of uh, lipids, cholesterol, and PEG that we have optimized. Uh, we were able to load the chemotherapy, irinotecan. Irinotecan is a chemotherapy that could be pumped out by those ABCD1 and ABCD2. So it's a good drug that we can think about locking it inside the cancer cell. So we were able to package this agent and put it in. Uh, Package them in this nano formulation, the nano lipids are more below 10, they're about like 150 ish nanometers. And on the other hand, we conjugate our benzocortin derivative to an antibody. In this case, we didn't use the USC2 that I just talked about, we used kind of an EGFY and antibody just to showcase that we can target like proteins at the cell surface. So we were able to decorate our. Uh, that is always these uh, photoimmune conjugates that contains cetaxanab and BPD, and uh, their uh, size is around like 158 like, nanometers. And it's pretty good uh, polydispersive index below 0.1. So I'm skipping a lot of results, but I'm showing you kind of the most, uh, one of the most important one is to look at three components. So if we think about the three important components of the cell, it will be the cell membrane, the cytoplasma, and the nucleus, right? So in this study, the student had this idea that if we target all three major components of the cell, hopefully we can achieve the best therapeutic outcome. So, so first, the construct uh, did result in uh, this epidermal growth factor receptor down regulation, as you can see here, after 24 hours, you pretty much don't see the signal. And looking at, uh, when we turn on the light, right, because our photosensitizers eventually locate to the mitochondria, some of them, right, we can depolarize the mitochondria. 
And then finally, the leakage of these chemotherapy that we built into the construct will leak out and lead to a DNA damage, as you can see here, increasing GAMH2AX. So this is kind of a schematic my students summarized. You can see we have this construct. Initially, it will come in. It will target the serpent receptor, in this case, EGFR. Definitely, we want to target uh, these transporters eventually. And through the, uh, the uptake and then uh, lysosomal degradation of the construct and release of the photosensitizers, we know some of these photosensitizers will end up in mitochondria. So when we turn on the light, we can uh, uh, induce like cytochrome release, like induce apoptosis, and lastly, the release of some of these chemo drugs can go in and induce like DNA damage. And so this is kind of the the idea that uh, the student had, and we have definitely shown that in cancer cells that overexpress like EGFR. But I'm pointing you towards here in this pink line. This is basically showing that. It's most effective in reducing the cell availability. And one of the controls that we feel like it's really important is why go through all these like, steps, like conjugating one to another. Like, do we really need to conjugate them, or can we just simply mix them together? So the answer is, it seems like we do need to conjugate them in a particular way because we compared it with a non-conjugated formulation, in this case, in vitro. And doing some uh, combination index analysis, we uh, noticed that there's a strong synergistic effect at a certain uh, light dose. Uh, if you okay. So currently we're uh, moving on from this like in vitro stuff into more animal study, looking to how these uh, conjugates bind to micrometastases in an ovarian cancer peritoneal metastasis model. So as you can see here, we have different controls. We have the BPD, kind of the clinical formulation, just putting in lipids. We have the PIC, which is just the antibody and the photosensitizer. We have the PIC now you need, like that leads to a more enhanced uptake. And this is a phenomenon that uh, me and Dr. Hassan has observed but in many studies, so that is a, a, another talk that uh, I'm happy to talk to you about this later, why do we see much more signal here. But the good thing is that using our formulation, we can achieve a much better accumulation of the drugs, the chemotherapy, and the photosensitizer in tumor cells in vivo. So this is quite exciting, and currently we have several versions of these uh, constructs. One direction is to really understand when these, each of these components starts falling apart by tagging them with the size and trying to image them and dissect out the, the biodistribution profile and the uh, degradation kinetics of our formulation. Okay? So, Hopefully after this third part, I have convinced you that uh, we can use uh, our nanotechnology to co-deliver photosensitizer and chemotherapy. And photosensitizers, if you engineer properly, hopefully we can use it to shut down some of these transporters. But if we think about drug delivery, I think it's beyond just inhibiting these transporters. For example, in the case of brain, uh, cancer, we have to think this more as a two-way street. And this is a, uh, a series of images showing you that how bad is ovarian cancer. The problem, uh, sorry, with brain cancer, the problem is not not being able to remove the primary tumor, but it's this, these residual disease that eventually come back and kill the patient. So how do we really manage and mitigate by the disease return disease that uh, people can really see and image and remove them. And this is another like, good example. You see the primary tumor on the uh, upper right, but if you zoom in into the edge, you see a lot of these infiltrated, uh, infiltrates like into the normal brain tissue. And this is problematic because Within the primary brain tumor, most of the BBB is already compromised. So, and so just like, we we'll prefer cutting them out if they can. The problem is surrounding these residual disease or uh, infiltrative disease, like the blood-brain barrier remains intact. So 
That's why uh, a lot of times brain surgery followed by chemotherapy kill that you won't work too well just because they can't go to uh, the broken barrier. So this is a cartoon basically zooming in and showing you that a lot of groups are focusing on opening the tight junction. And there are also groups thinking about strategies to open up the tight junction and shutting down these uh, transporters simultaneously. And they have shown that by using a dual approach to not only open the tight junction, but also shut down these transporters so you can dramatically improve brain drop delivery. But, and PDT turns out to be an ideal too because you can do two things. You can turn the lights, you can release uh, the tight junction, loosen it up, and you can also potentially shut down some of these transporters in the brain. So now we have one tool that can modulate the bidirectional transport of the drug. So this is just to show you that in this rodent model, you have a tumor here. When you do the standard like photodynamic therapy at a higher dose, oftentimes you will have a lot of normal tissue damage. As you can see here, it's seen by the uh, uh, fibrinogen and lysine, like uh, showing early signs of uh, necrosis and by both normal tissue here and human tissue. So because of that, our lab and my work with Taraba has been pushing for this like no dose photodynamic therapy, basically thinking about as priming the cell or the tumor marker environment at the low dose. We're not going to kill them, but we're going to set them up for the next treatment. So this is just to show in an in vitro model that if we use a low dose photodynamic uh, uh, therapy, photodynamic priming, we can open up the tight junctions, the blood brain barrier in vitro, and then after nine days, they could like, recover, they can go back to the like, original state. So basically the blue one is no light radiation, and then we have like 0.6 to 1.3 joules per cm square. At day one, you see a dramatic increase, suggesting the, uh, the, the permeability is high, but eventually everything comes down back to its uh, baseline. So this is just like optimizing the dose and uh, nothing uh, um, like not magic. But this is what we found like during kind of our immunostaining. We found out we're interested in understanding what's happening with these tight junction proteins. Because a lot of people have shown that if you do PDD, you can down-regulate these tight junction proteins. But what we found out is, in this case, when we use a no dose, we don't really modulate their expression. However, we modulate their phenotype. So typically, you see more of these continuous junctions. But when we apply photodynamic priming, we see more punctated and perpendicular junctions. So we think because of the change of these junctional phenotype it leads to a higher permeability without modulating the expression of these uh, junctions. So this is quite uh, exciting and in this specific study we are creating a carrier free BPD formulation. As I mentioned to you before, BPD in the clinics requires lipid. If you don't do lipid, if you just mix BPD PBS, this is, you see a lot of aggregate. This is the liposomal uh, formulation that people typically use in clinic. Oh no, yep. Yeah. So here, yeah, yeah, thank you. So here, I want to point out that uh, basically we created a for very unique formulation. They basically form into small balls, like about like 50 or 100 nanometers, and they can be well solubilized in aqueous solution. So now we don't need to use lipids and anything else. This is quite exciting because we all think about all these lipid formulations as really like biocompatible and non-toxic. But when we start digging into a little bit more, there's a lot of like toxicology and in the logical consideration that we have to do because they do kind of modulate some of the immune responses a little bit. So 
but this is the direction that we're going with Irish beef cholesterol. And what we did here is we showed that using this newer formulation, we compare it to LA and looking to how we can open up the blood brain barrier. So in this study, we apply our photolandic timing at low dose using our new DPD agent or the clinical use LA, which will be converted into PP9. We showed that because DPD can be excited at a slightly longer wavelength to have a better penetration compared to using LA PP9, and then uh, this is controlled. And there's some quantification of the Evans group, which will uh, like cause the bubble barrier, like uh, uh, if the DPD is uh, being compromised. So basically, uh, here we just demonstrate that our agent is a good agent right, to use it to, to open up the blood brain barrier in animals. And what is exciting is we are looking to a lot of normal tissue damage. Right? The thing that we're focusing here is like we want to open up the blood brain barrier, but we don't, don't want to damage all those like normal tissue to blood density. So, and the last slide is showing you here that we did observe a really uh, modest decrease in these transporters, like intensity score. But these uh, stay, these uh, slides are essentially staying in the transporters uh, that are in the brain. And you see a slight downregulation of that uh, transporter expression. But even the transporter is there after photodynamic therapy, we don't know if it functions. Still the same, right? As I showed you before, we can induce protein cross linking, like you can still pick up the signal, but it doesn't mean that the protein is functional. So the next step or problem for us is to really figure out, okay, like what's the function of these transporters like before the active photodynamic priming in the brain, right? And to what degree are we modulating them? So hopefully today I convince you that uh, ABC drug transporters, like uh, media drug resistance is a true problem. There is no good solution out there. We think photodynamic therapy could be like uh, one of the promising solutions just because we have that layer of selectivity. And through like uh, biomolecular engineering and nanoengineering, we can co-deliver like agents like to the tumor site more efficiently. And hopefully by considering like other components as well, like we can like improve the overall drug accumulation, not only in the tumor, but also inside the cell as well. And with that, I would like to stop here, and uh, thank you very much for being here, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions.